Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Professor Panagetiri's lecture at Aprilin ao Vivo Linguists Online. I hope that all of you attending the event today are healthy and safe. I'm Vitor Nobrega. I'm a linguist and currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the Laboratory for Human Evolutionary Studies at the University of Sao Paulo. I'm primarily a morphologist with great interest in the nature of grammatical primitives, especially roots, the main topic of today's lecture. Let me start by thanking Abralin, especially Abralin's president, Professor Miguel Oliveira Jr. and its vice president, Raquel Freitag, for making this event possible. And on behalf of Abralin and of my fellow colleagues in Brazil, I would like to thank Professor Panagatiris for kindly accepting our invitation to collaborate with this project. It's a huge pleasure to have you remotely with us today. Abralin ao Vivo, Linguists Online, is an international initiative in cooperation with the Comité Internacional Permanent de Linguistes, the Asociación de Linguística y Filología de América Latina, La Sociedad Argentina de Estudios Linguísticos, Asociación de Linguística Aplicada do Brasil, La Asociación Internacional de Linguística Aplique, Linguistic Society of America, Linguistics Association of Great Britain, Societas Linguística Europea, Australian Linguistic Society, British Association for Applied Linguistics, and the Sociedad Española de Linguística. This afternoon, Professor Panagetiris will be offering us an, an overview of the current understanding of the content and form of linguistic roots. Pivos Panagetiris is Professor of Theoretical Linguistics and Chair of English Studies at the University of Cyprus. He earned his PhD from Essex University in 2000. He's author of two monographs, Pronouns, Critics, and Empty Nouns by Benjamins, by John Benjamins, 2002, uh, and Categorial Features, a Generative Theory of Word Class Categories by Cambridge University Press, 2015. He's also the author of a successful Greek language popular science introduction to linguistics, Talk to Me About Language by Crete University Press 2013. He has presented over 180 papers and talks and has published extensively in international journals and in jointly authored volumes. His research interests include lexical categories, adjectives, roots, pronouns, the nominal domain, mixed projections, and the syntax of Greek and Balkan languages. So let's now enjoy Panagiotidis' lecture on roots in 2020. After his lecture, we'll have up to 30 minutes of questions and discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to be back to Brazil, even if it's just virtually. I wish to thank Abrilin for the kind invitation and Vito for the introduction. So as promised today, I'm going to um, offer you a review of our, you know, what we think we know about linguistic roots or what we know, I should be a bit more upbeat perhaps, about linguistic roots in 2020. So um, I'll try to take things, I'll try taking things from the beginning. Now this means the 19th century. Now um, roots were one of the first matters, historical linguistics, uh, in the 19th century, you know, the, the old Indo-Europeanist tra tradition turned its attention to. And according to the Indo-European research program, um, roots amounted to the something like the idealized common denominator of individual related words. What happens if you take um, words from a number of languages, um, strip them off from all language specific morphology, and then correct what you get for um, language-specific and family-specific, family as in Romance, Germanic, and so on, um, sound laws. And some all too familiar examples are different words for uh, something like a male relative that is younger than us. There is a reason I'm being vague here. And uh, so old English words, um, like never, you know, never in old high German, nepos, uh, nepodes, uh, napat, uh, and so on. Uh, all these were understood to descend. Remember, the notion of root initially is one that has to do with historical linguistics. So to descend from a proto-Indo-European root, nepot. Okay. Now, um, in the 20th century approaches, roots are, of course, understood to be at the heart of content words. So um, roots are understood for the most part of the 20th century to be the exclusive stock of morphology, right? Entities that are completely opaque 
to syntactic processes because lexicalism, right? And um, lexicalism is the prevalent idea or program in the best of cases that the word domain is sort of more or less uh, impenetrable to the machination, machinations of syntax. And one very nice and cute rule of thumb about what a root might be would be something like a root is what remains after all the morphology has been wrung out of a form. Uh, the ringing movement is pretty evocative in this case. Right. Now, um, towards the end of the 20th century, uh, we have the advent of separationist and realizational approaches to morphology. In other words, approaches whereby uh, the combinatorial system, call it syntax if you want, manipulates feature structures, right? And then what happens is you have morphology in this, in this some sort of component or um, interface thing or rule system, depends, right? That actually takes these feature structures and matches them with forms. Okay, that's in a nutshell, the separationist realization approach to morphology. Now, yeah? and um, one, According to these approaches, roots are now um, a combinatorially relevant class because now roots are the building blocks of grammatical structures uh, in a way that doesn't actually restrict them inside the, let's say, magically sheltered you know, word domain, but you know they are a bona fide. Um, elements that participates in the making of structures at large, right? And distributed morphology is one of the most famous, but definitely not the only one, of course, um, separationist uh, realizational approach. And the reason I'm going to be framing most of the discussion in this presentation uh, along the lines of uh, DM, distributed morphology, is because DM, along with the framework developed in Borer's 21st century work is one of the few frameworks that make concrete hypotheses about roots. Concrete and, I should add, interesting. Interesting in the sense of empirically testable. Now, <clears throat> roots in early DM were initially assumed to be exceptional in many ways. Three of them, the main ones, are the ones listed on this uh, slide here. First of all, roots were understood to be syntactically active, occupying syntactic nodes. Now, this is understood because, well, that's the idea behind separationist um, framework, more or less. Second, they were intrinsically associated with concepts. Now, that's pretty interesting because you had a root like, I don't know, to take a word like, uh, you know, blackbirds, okay, and you can say that um, eventually this is composed of two roots. Of course, the story is not that simple, like black and bird. And then the idea is that each of the roots making up, ultimately making up this compound, um, has some sort of concept associated with it. So roots would be understood to be associated with concepts, concrete or less concrete. So roots were perhaps not always um, explicitly, but definitely in practice, understood to be something like quasi-signs, quasi-signs the Saussurean sense, right? Some kind of structuralist combination of a form, signifier, you know, and the signified. It's very strange, and we'll see why it's strange. Third, roots in early distributed morphology, but not only in DM, uh, were understood to be phonologically identified. Now, this means that roots, unlike everything else in the DM machinery, uh, do not undergo late insertion, but are rather identified via their phonological features. Now, again, I'll come back to this. This is pretty exceptional, if not weird, uh, exactly because DM is a separationist um, realizational model. Model You expect that, you know, what the combinatorial system manipulates is not forms, but feature structures. But we'll come back to this. So DM, roots in early DM, syntactically active, 
intrinsically associated with concepts phonologically identified, okay? Now, are we happy with that? No, we're definitely not happy. When I say we, I mean uh, us plus people working in DM. Now, first of all, these three ways in which roots were understood to be exceptional um, are internally inconsistent with, you know, the DM framework itself, and they're empirically inadequate. So in this talk, um, you know, I'll just nail my colors on the mast, as we used to say when I was a student, and a uh, long, long time ago, last century. And we will go the way of Harley 2014, uh, her theoretical um, linguistics paper, and also interact with work by Aquaviva, Borer, and well, myself. Um, and take roots to be uh, exceptional in a way that is not one of the two ways, namely phonologically identified and being quasi signs they were in early DM. We will also take for granted the DM claim, <clears throat> sorry, that roots are uncategorized elements, that they don't have inherent category. In other words, there are no inherently nominal or verbal, let alone adjectival roots and that roots will have to be categorized by grammar and grammatical categorization yields nouns, verbs, adjectives, and what have you. Okay, now let's begin with root content. Remember that one of the claims in DM literature is that roots are exceptional because uh, they carry you know, the content with them. They have some sort of content. They, they're associated with some denotation Maybe vague, maybe not. Um, so what we have here, when we talk about root content, when we talk about the content of roots before they are categorized, before they're inserted in a structure, uh, is basically a shadow, an echo of the very old common denominator of individual related words thing, or a reflex, if you like. Now, there are some well-behaved cases, of course, that actually justify this reflex. I mean, if you look at butter the verb and butter the noun, land the noun and land the verb, the triplet red, redness, redden, you know, obviously what you have there is um, words that contain the same root and are related. So, you know, butter, well, the root butter must be about, well, the greasy animal fat substance, right? And if you look at um, work by uh, Maya Arad, uh, her 2005 book in particular, there is the example there of the, well, remember, roots are ineffable in Semitic, right? So we can call it clut something. Um, and that root gives you words like shelter, receiver, record, um, the made that word for cassette, because in everyday Hebrew, cassette is something like cassette. Um, input and verbs like absorb, receive, and record. So the idea is that if you look at this root, the clit root, um, the words derived from it are related. So what you can do is you can, um, you know, look at the words, put them together, and try to find their common semantic, you know, denominator, if you like. And according to Arad, uh, this makes it look like that the root cult in isolation, you know, if you strip away, if you wring away all morphology, whatever, you know, is a very abstract common meaning core along the lines of keep, preserve. So what would shelter, receiver, record, cassettes, input and also the verbs absorb, receive and record would have in common, well, there would be something about uh, keeping, preserving, right? So Arad's idea, Arad's actually hypothesis is that roots are assigned multiple contextual meaning, okay? They, they, they contain this sort of common denominator, you know, and then according to the syntactic environment, or if you'd like to be more neutral, the grammatical, the structural environment they're inserted in, they are 
get different meanings. So an uncategorized root contains the common semantic denominator, there we are again, of the words derived from it. So it would be something like key preserve in the case we just reviewed. And this common semantic denominator can be quite concrete, as in the case of, let's say, butter, right? Or something rather abstract, as in the case of this um, triconsonantal uh, Hebrew root. Now, um, the kind of you know reply to this is uh, a point made by Arnoff in his 2007 language paper that, well, next to roots like cult, you have roots like kiddush. Okay, and um, a root like this, as you can see on this slide, gives you words meaning gangway, step, degree, pickled fruit, paved road, highway, compression, furnace, kin, and also verbs like conquer, so conquer, subdue, press, pave, pickle, preserve, um, and hide, and stuff like that. So if if you take these words and put them together, I mean you can hardly find any sort of common semantic denominator. So multiple contextual meaning in this case would not rely on some sort of core quasi Saucerian sign, you know, with a vague signified perhaps. But I mean, it's anyone's guess. Now, I'm going to make a very short parenthesis here. If you present these facts to a scholar of Hebrew, they will tell you, aha, yeah, but historically, and then they will explain to you that you know, um, pressure and pushing and uh, squeezing together is how you pickle fruit and how traditional um, furnaces and kins worked, worked and so on and so forth. But you realize that what we're interested in here is not the origin of words, but the intrinsic tacit knowledge you know, of native speakers. So if you have native speakers of Hebrew and you have had native speakers of Hebrew uh, you know, for some time now, right? Um, you need to ask yourself, what kind of common semantic denominator is there out of all these words that justifies some kind of, uh, you know, uh, core meaning for a root like Kaddish? Now, um, there are other, way, other ways to look at things. So Levinson was, I think, the first who argued that, well, roots are polysemous, right? And actually, Marantz talks of allosemy on a par with allomorphy. So what's the idea is that maybe roots like kibush and many others are actually polysemous, right? I mean, they have more than one meanings, if you like. And um, so, you know, you get different meanings in different environments the same way in the case of allomorphy, you have a morph or whatever you call it, and you get different forms of allophone, allomorphs, sorry, in different environments, okay? And um, of course, in the case of allomorphy, allomorphs are inserted uh, according to some version of the elsewhere condition, right? I mean, there's some sort of hierarchy apparently that defines environments from the most specific, the least specific ones, to the elsewhere case. And that's how you decide which allomorph you insert. Uh, in the case of purported polysemy or allosemy, there is no restriction like that, okay? What you have is what you have, right? Um, different allosims, to use uh, Marantz's terminology, are inserted where they are inserted, okay? If you go back, I mean, we could do that as, that as an exercise to the Kabish route. There doesn't seem to exist any way in which you can say, okay, and here is... Uh, a list of, you know, environments in which we insert different allosims, right? So the morphosyntactic environment in which each allosim, purported allosim, you know, different root meaning, if you like, is inserted, is hardly definable. Now, so what we need to do is we need to step back and stay alert and keep doubting. That's a nice stoic adage, you know, stoics, uh, that would be helpful here. So one thing we need to consider is that there are too many roots that can hardly be assigned some content. So kibush 
is not exactly a freak of nature. Then you have roots, even in languages like English. English is interesting because it has tens of thousands of roots, right? Where um, if you actually look at the roots and not at the nouns, you realize that they are also impossible to give some concrete uh, you know, meaning to construe them as quasi Sasurian signs. I mean, book is very famous, right? I mean, you have book the noun and book the verb. And book the verb has nothing to do with books, obviously. And a way to think about it is, is to say, oh, yeah, but you used to put reservations down in a book. Again, these are historical, philological explanations that don't make much sense, right? And then you have house and house, which is also discussed by Marantz in order to support his allosomy view. I mean, to house something, the verb, is not to put something in a house. Far from that. And then you have egg, you know, egg the verb, meaning encouraging, more or less. Uh, it's not about eggs. And you have object, the noun, object, the verb, and so on and so forth. And of course, you can come up with a number of stories claiming that there is massive um, uh, paradigmatic gaps and massive root homophony. But clearly, if you believe roots are psychologically real, you need to have a story about these things, and they'll try offering a story later. Now, the same thing about you know roots that don't seem to pretty much mean anything uh, can also be seen in Italian, the root met, which was um, discussed by Aquaviva. Um, well, you know, you, you look at the verbs derived from this root, and then you will be hard pressed unless you do the philological thing to come up with some kind of uh, core meaning for the root met in Italian. And then you have the same story. I mean, I'm not going to tie you with too many examples in languages as you know, different as Swahili, Bantu language, and then going back to our more familiar, I mean, our, me being from that part of the world, obviously, uh, Latin, Italian, Spanish, you know, you have roots that pretty straightforward pedestrian roots that don't seem to have any content at all. Okay, now, um, people like Saab have argued that maybe, you know, different roots have variable amounts of content. So some roots could have rich content like dog or butter. Some roots could have no content like met in Italian or kibush in Hebrew. And some roots could have, um, sorry, not ether, but vague content. Okay, I don't know how ether sneaked into this, maybe because it's very light or something. So clit, you know, would be something like that, you know, but, you know, the root has some content, not as concrete as dog or butter, but, you know, vague. Now, Lexiad and Londau uh, also go for a content scale, and they make a very interesting correlation that vaguer roots like met uh, give rise to more idiosyncratic word meanings and more specified and contentful roots like dog yield more compositional word meanings. They also draw a correlation, and Saab does that too, between the concreteness of a root and morphological unboundedness. So for example, a root like dog, which is a free morphine, right, in English, um, has rich content. And Alexiat and Londo claim that this is a general trend, right? That you know, roots surfacing as free morphemes tend to have rich and concrete content, roots surfacing as bound morphemes tend to have vaguer content. Um, and, you know, met and kibush would be cases to this point. Um, that looks like a very interesting generalization, and it's not completely invalid. But, you know, one question one must ask oneself is why would morphological behavior of a root, whether it's a free root or a bound root, right, correlate with the amount and type of its denotation, and second, how a native speaker is supposed to find out or decide how much content a root possesses? That's a serious question. So let me be a bit more concrete about root concreteness. Take the case of the root laser. Okay, now laser um, has um, a date, 
right? It was coined, at least it was published in 1957 as an acronym, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Okay, and this was very quickly, uh, um, you know, this quickly became a noun, laser. So if you have a root laser, okay, um, it only derived one noun, laser. So you can say, yeah, the root laser has very concrete content. I mean, it doesn't get more concrete than that. That's a particular kind of light. But then again, you know, there's only one word derived from this root. Now, in the near future, uh, we will probably see more words derived from the root laser. And already in sources like Urban Dictionary, uh, you get something like laser as a synonym for cool. So if someone's laser, someone's cool. And the laser stare is a, like a direct stare, right? And throwing a laser in American football is throwing a straight shoot, okay? So what happens is that the more productive the root is becoming, the less contentful and the less concrete it gets. Uh, similar facts apply to my favorite root, um, uh, Zahar, which is you know, the root that gives you the word, the Greek word for sugar, but I'm not going to bother you with Greek, uh, not, not yet. So um, the illusion of semantic concreteness as illustrated by laser um, the root laser, I repeat, is created by the fact that very, very few words are derived from it. Now, so you see how things go, right? I mean, if a root is bound like met and is very promiscuous, you expect it to make more words. So there are many more chances that, you know, uh, these words are unrelated or not very related to each other. Kabush is also the case at this point, And that makes them look vague, right? At the same time, if a root like dog, you know, is a free morphine, then maybe it's not going to derive that many words. And this will give you an illusion of there being some relatively concrete content in it. So um, the idea is that there is no root content as such. There is no content in isolation for roots. Roots are not quasi-signs. There's no such thing as lexical semantics you can do with roots or anything like that. So we're going back to this you know, citation by Arnoff, which I like very much. Words have morphological structure even when they are not compositionally derived, and roots are morphologically important entities, even though not particularly characterized by lexical meaning. Being a bit more radical, Roots don't identify word-specific non-structural meaning. So the illusion of inherent semantic content of roots can be enhanced in cases where a particular lexical item yields a number of derived words in its turn. So I have a root, stuff, right? I mean, it derives, let's say, two nouns, okay, A and B. Now, if A is extremely productive and gives many more, you know, denominal things like adjectives or even other nouns or compound nouns or what have you, then you end up having the illusion that, okay, this root must be about that because, oh, look, you have so many words derived from it. But this is clearly an illusion created by the productivity of particular, let's say, nouns or verbs or adjectives, okay? So, um, we are better off thinking of roots as contentless entities. What about the morphological thing? You know, the second way in which DM takes roots to be exceptional and which we think is not a correct um, assumption. Now, the idea, that, the idea that roots are formed is quite persistent, even in separationist frameworks like DM, also in Aronoff and Mutatis Mutandis, in Borer. Conceptually, inserting roots early, I mean, when I say inserting roots early, I mean as form something correspondences. I say something because there is no signifier to that, right? That's what we just said. So conceptually, inserting roots early is a problem already noticed by Joe Emmons in 1985. If roots are identified by their form, or are inserted as forms, then they carry their phonological features throughout the derivation. And that's exactly the reason why I said that early insertion of roots 
is incompatible with the philosophy, you know, with the rationale of the separationist framework, right? If the idea is that you manipulate features and then you get your forms matched, why have the roots a special privilege of being forms all the way down? Hmm? Also, if form is the criterion to identify roots, then there is possibly no such thing as root homophony, but there is. And two, true root suppletion cannot exist. So, you know, if roots are inserted early, you expect them to be there as forms. You, know, you don't expect root suppletion and you don't expect much or any at all in the way of um, root homophony. And, you know, genuine, genuine root suppletion actually would be a strong argument for late insertion of roots, right? If there is some kind of abstract root, an abstract index, as I'm going to argue, then you would expect it to have different forms associated with it, right? No problem. Now, of course, the obvious cases of root suppletion have been argued quite convincingly by a number of people, including Enbic and Marantz, uh, not to be cases of root suppletion, but instances of functional allomorphy. So, you know, when people tell you, okay, look, B is, R was, were, etc. there you are, root suppletion. The answer is no, there are no roots involved there because clearly what you have in the case of the copula is not some kind of, you know, genuine lexical verb but probably a bunch of features, right? What, again, Emmons called um, grammatical verbs and what has been called ever since a semi-lexical verb. So it's a bunch of features, there's no root involved. So clearly you don't talk about root suppletion when you have things like be, is, are, was, were, and other more functiony things. However, you do have cases like the French e, e, okay, which are genuine instances of root suppletion and actually we also have you know the environment in which you get the different forms so assuming there is a root i okay in an environment of plural number you get u in every other environment you get u okay that's grossly simplifying and actually extensive verb verb stem allomorphy exists in a number of languages harley 2014 discusses that giving also a lot of references herself. And Greek is a good example. So you take um, a root, okay, for C in Greek, and the one form, the one allomorph you, you get is vlep, which is when you have imperfective aspects. And in all other cases, you have ev. And uh, the root for say, again, in modern Greek, uh, is realized as le or, or leg in an environment of imperfective aspect and some as p and the, and the empty vowel okay there is work for that i'll be happy to give references later in all other environments and similar cases for a verb like eat the reason i chose these verbs is because they are bona fide lexical verbs they're not words like you know come go be etc which of course are probably cases of you know functional allomorphy and not um, root suppletion. So root suppletion is real and it's a very strong argument that roots are inserted late like everything else. And that's of course something already claimed by a number of people including Galani, Siddiqui and Haugen. And the interesting thing is that once we distinguish roots from the forms realizing them, then we can understand a number of things. First of all, that some roots have apparent categorical specifications. Second, that you can make generalizations about morphological constraints on root form. For example, roots matching with particular declension classes, roots being realized as three constant skeletons, as in Semitic, right? I mean, it wouldn't make much sense saying that this is a property of a root, but makes a lot of sense saying this is a property of the morphological realization of the vocabulary items, if you like, realizing roots. And of course, the morphological forms, let's say, you know, vocabulary items, right, realizing roots may also spell out functional terminals or semi-lexical categories. For example, will may spell out the noun and the archaic verb, right, derived from a root will, so will and testament and I will that, okay, the archaic way of saying I desire that. 
but it can also, the form will, uh, be the exponents, the vocabulary item, that is matched with the future feature. No problem with that. Okay, there's no reason to go out of your way and talk about, I don't know, whatever. Now, where does this take us? If roots are not their form, and if roots, if root forms are inserted late, and if roots are not quasi Saussurian signs, but are completely devoid of any semantic content, they, if they do not, uh, if they are not, I'm sorry, associated with any denotations in isolation, but only inside grammatical structure, then what is a root? Now, a root, according to a definition I subscribe, is a syntax internal criterion of lexical identity. Different roots are different indices. Now, different indices point to different concepts. How can this happen? Well, they point at to different concepts inside linguistic structure, never outside linguistic structure. How can this happen? Well, roots, indices, right, enable otherwise identical syntactic structures, say MPs, right, to be associated with different concepts, to make different nouns, right? So you have two identical structures, let's say a nominalizer, okay, and just that, right? And the nominalizer and root A, okay, gives you noun cat and nominalizer and root B gives you the noun dog. There is a diagram about that later. So in the absence of a root, only the formal features of the structure, say of this noun phrase, will be interpreted and this would give us empty nouns in a semi-lexical category. And semi-lexical categories exist, namely lexical structures that do not contain any roots. So now there's a very nice picture the root is there only in order to make different nouns and verbs, right? How does this happen? Well, because identical structures or otherwise identical structures can now be differentiated because they contain different roots. And that's what makes a root an index. And that's what makes a root the syntax internal criterion of lexical identity. And here is the diagram, right? So if you have a number phrase, I tried giving some more structure here, you know, and no root, uh, well, this structure will be associated with no concept, you'll have an empty noun, something like one in English, I like the strange ones, right? On the other hand, once you have a root, okay, now you can have this structure associated with the concept, and of course, changing the roots, you change the concepts, this very simple structure can be associated, uh, sorry, associated with. Now, the next question is, are roots feature structures? Now, the paradox ensuing from understanding a root to be contentless, I mean, semantically contentless, is that it can have no interpretable formal features because it can have no instructions to the conceptual and essential systems. And of course, if roots are not forms, then they do not contain themselves as indices, phonological features either. Okay. Now, of course, uh, we could conceive each root as a feature. Right? So for example, for example, the root dog is a feature, the root cat is a different feature, but this would trivialize the very notion feature. And also features qua roots would be uninterpretable. So are roots featureless indices? Well, the answer some of us give is yes. Look, however, look at the slides. I'm not saying yes, right? I'm just orally asserting it's yes. And of course, the next question um, is, what kind of beast is this? Off the record, I can tell you that when Noam Chomsky first heard about this idea, he said, this is absurd. And I think I can understand why. What is a featureless object? Well, a featureless object that can be man manipulated by the, you know, the combinatorial system could be numeric, a numeric index, an address. And that's, of course, not my idea by any means, but has been aired before quite extensively too. Now, if you take this numerical notation Seriously, so say that, you know, the root that gives a nine dog is root 346. The root giving you the noun cat is, um, 
the root for 7-Eleven, something, right? So if we take this numerical notation seriously, or even literally, we can think of roots as the hijacking of the successor function by the facultative language. Okay. That's, again, an idea uh, uh, by Richard Larson. Now, this would make roots a recent evolutionary development, okay? Even if there is some kind of combinatorial system at home in our ancestors, or even our cousins, all those languageless extinct homo species, you know, the Neanderthals, apparently the Denisovans, who knows who else. Um, what would be one of the recent developments that give us language the way we have it could be the meeting of some kind of combinatorial system, perhaps pre-existing, perhaps, um, with the success of function in the sense that now the combinatorial system was, was not only able to manipulate features, formal features, which, which apparently pre-exist. There's a very interesting work by Nobrega on that. But also it could handle numerical indices exploding the expressive capacity of language because now you could use the same structure to talk about different animals. Let's talk about animals. animals. Okay. Now, let's take a pause. I'll actually take a sip of, this is just water, I'm afraid. Um, although right now it's 20 to midnight where I am, so it would be cool for something different, maybe later. So all this is a story that I hope makes a lot of sense and has been popularized by Heidi Harley's work. Um, the question is the following, how do we identify roots, right? Um, because what the story I'm trying to sell here is that, you know, although they are exceptional in their featurelessness, roots are matched with form and meaning late at the interfaces like everything else. So roots are exceptional, but not in the way early DM thought they, they are. But what I'm saying here is that they are ordinary in the sense that they will eventually be matched with some kind of meaning and some kind of form, like everything else, inside linguistic structures, right? But at the same time, the roots are exceptional because they're featureless. Now, how are they identified, if not phonologically, or by their content? I mean, if they have no content. So I think that we need basic, when I say basic, I mean fundamental, not trivial, UG external principles that will refer to both grammatical structure and morphological exponents. And I would think that root identification on behalf of native speakers is where grammatical acquisition meets word learning. Now, I'm going to sketch how I think this could work. So I have three identification principles and one super principle, which are pretty straightforward. So how do we identify roots if not by the content, they have none, or by the form? Well, actually, we do it by the form. So the first heuristic, if you like, assumption is that if two words contain the same root form, then they're derived from the same root, all other things being equal, right? So if you have a word like um, egg and egg, now verb, well, all other things being equal, they're derived from the same root, right? In other words, you have to motivate root homophony. We'll come back to this. So they walk the same, they talk the same, they have the same root, something like this, okay? Of course, factoring in the morphological and morphological vagaries of individual languages. Now, the consequence of this very simple first principle, you know, a, a form-based identification or recognition mechanism is that there is no meaning bias in root identification. So very different words will be derived from the same root. Now, this is already something argued for extensively in uh, Borer's name only. Second consequence, speakers will be strongly biased to identify roots based on form when they encounter another word. So the first guess would be, okay, it sounds like this, okay, it contains that root. And the interesting thing, of course, is that they're not going to bother if this word means something completely crazy, right? Because at the end of the day, roots in isolation have no form, sorry, have no content. Roots 
by themselves and not to three and signs. Now, this brings us to a nice problem because remember I had the caveat all things being equal. We have two nice nouns in Greek. Uh, both are pronounced kori and both are feminine singular. Uh, sorry, they're feminine nouns. We have grammatical gender in Greek, right? And I'm giving you the citation forms which are singular and nominative. Now, kori means daughter and kori means I pupil. Now, same form. So does this mean we have the same root involved? The answer is no. Because what we have is two identical feature structures built around the same roots and have exactly the same morphological exponents, feminine, right? And also the kind of feminine ending. So also in terms of forms, they are identical. <coughs> and these identical feature structures built around apparently the same roots and having exactly the same morphological exponents would be matched with two different denotations, daughter and pupil. So the roots as a syntax internal criterion of lexical identity would fail. This forces the speaker, I believe, to assume root homophony. So this brings us to the second identification principle of roots, which is that different denotation in the same form, in the same for syntactic environment, forces the speaker to posit two different roots. Now, morphosyntactic environment means both the morphosyntactic features, let's say five features in our case, and the structure and their exponents. And the trees I have to the right sort of illustrate this situation. So you have two identical structures. I'm giving number phrases for um, you know, ease of exponents, sorry. And uh, what I have there is um, that you have these structures associated with different concepts, like daughter and pupil, exactly because in one case you have uh, root core one or 343, if you like. In the second case, you have core two or 569, if you like, right? The only thing that will distinguish these identical, both in terms of vocabulary item, form, exponents, and in terms of morphosyntactic features is the different root. So in that case, native speakers are forced to posit root homophony uh, and they're forced to say, no, we have two different roots here. Root one, root two, okay? And actually, root homophony in synthetic languages like Greek is hardly an isolated curiosity. I have here some, you know, cases like comma, 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 which means party, coma, or comma. Uh, pound and liar, leaf and sex. And these are um, nouns, I chose nouns for ease of exposition, that are identical both in their feature structure and in their external exponents. Now, a third principle would be suppletion. So if two roots, uh, if two form, or if two, I'm sorry, let's go again. If two root forms are in complementary distribution, then we're dealing with root suppletion. So if there is complementary distribution between forms belonging to the same, let's say, lexeme, then speakers will assume root suppletion. Now, that's the story of eyes in French, oeil, you. Okay, they're in complementary distribution according to number, then they must be allomorphs, okay, of the same root. Now, root suppletion is much more common with verbs because verbs tend to offer many more morphological environments for the speaker to observe clear cases of complementary distribution. And here I'm giving you again the case of the Greek verb for eating, uh, which um, whose root gives rise to two different forms, which are actually stems, verbal stems. Okay. Now, the final identification super principle is time. Now, this is pretty speculative. 
I think that all principles, three previous principles, apply just once and on the existing lexicon. So my claim would be that roots are identified once and there's no retroactive tinkering of roots. So if you learn when you're, let's say, three, a word that contains a string, let's say, path or something, right? Uh, you will establish this as a root according to the principles I listed. And then if, let's say, when you turn 12, you learn the learned word that contains, um, you know, again, some string, which is associated with the root, of course, path, uh, you will, uh, you know, go back and say, oh, it's the same root, all other things being equal, and you're not to create a new root because, oh, look, this is a different word or whatever. I have some more details on that in a paper I'll be happy to, to share, but I don't want to extend the discussion too much towards this front right now, so I'll be happy to perhaps answer a question or something. So that's it. I tried keeping it short and hopefully sweet. And um, I'll be happy to hear any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thibus, uh, for such a thought provoking uh, lecture. Uh, we have some questions, but before I jump into the questions, I will uh, start with a uh, provocation. So uh, you've mentioned that you described the idea that roots are void of phonological and uh, and uh, some content. And I would uh, ask you, uh, why should we stick to the idea of a dedicated primitives for roots and not simply assume that we have like in the Belder work, like just a structurally determined part. Uh, uh, so this, this, this define this, the roots is structurally or even resort simply to the idea of features like uh, admitting that uh, roots are in a way uh, feature, uh, an indexed portion of the syntactic structure. So why should we still admit uh, that roots are, um, should serve as a determined primitive in the grammar, not just resort to a, a separate device for fetching concepts and the phonological instructions at the interfaces. I'm not sure I understand the, the empirical differences that two uh, formulations have. And that's not rhetorical. I honestly, because of course I, 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 I'm familiar with what you're saying, you know, the Belder's work. Um, I'm not sure I can clearly see the empirical differences between the two approaches. Um, my, my only concern is that we have roots as um, criteria of, um, you know, lexical identity, syntax internal criteria of lexical identity, perhaps the only syntax internal criteria of lexical identity. Now, the way this is implemented is something that is worth exploring. My only concern about thinking of roots as features is that then you need a slightly different theory of features. And I believe that we need to keep features, um, let's say UG features or formal features different from roots because they do um, very different jobs, as I tried explaining. And also for reasons explored in work by yourself. So my answer is, uh, yes, I'll be happy to explore things, you know, go down this path. Once I, I have a clear understanding, which I, I don't, and that's something that has to do with me, obviously, uh, of the different kind of predictions we would get. Thank, thank you, Phoebus. Uh, I have some uh, questions uh, from the chat. Uh, one of them is uh, is a comment by Janina Carvalho, mm -hmm. and she says about Sab's idea. This is somehow the reframing of the last co functional divide into roots. The last co functional divide is not clear regarding parts of speech, for instance, state prepositions. It doesn't mean that this division doesn't exist, even though roots like laser can be counterexamples. So, would you like to comment on this? Well, uh, my my my. my... You know, my story about the lexical functional distinction is one of feature interpretability and uh, 
my understanding of what is lexical has to do with what has interpretable categorical features. And uh, I think the problem with propositions is that uh, we look at them not in a Zvenonius type way, which I think is roughly the right way of doing it as complex structures, but we tend to uh, identify them with, let's say, the adverbial part that is visible in languages like, you know, Romance and English and, and so on. So um, if the question is about the lexical functional distinction, uh, I think that the interesting thing is that roots are, uh, the, 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 the question of roots is orthogonal to that. Yes. So the lexical functional distinction would be a, a question about the interpretability of categorical features, and then roots do the job they do. Now, the interesting thing is that according to this whole, you know, conception, uh, Categorical features can only um, are the only, let's say, categorization. Let's be a bit more neutral. Is the only device to acclimatize roots. So uh, categorization is something that lexical elements can do, and not functional elements. And again, in synthetic languages, this can be seen quite easily. That you know, you always need the mediation of something that is the reflex of a nominalizer or even a verbalizer. Greek again offers a lot of evidence for that, uh, and then you do your functional stuff. So, to to try to like tidy up my answer, uh, yes, the lexical functional distinction is real. Yes, it's a question of different of interpretability of categorical features. And at the same time, roots are in principle independent from this distinction. But then again, roots can only be categorized by, let's say, lexical elements. So that's the way I think things work. Great. Uh, we have a question by Rafael Minussi, uh, and he asks, uh, would it be possible to think that the speaker makes some kind of choice when a root enters the derivation in the syntactic? It enters the derivation. Um, in principle, yes, but then again, um, my question is, what kind of choice? Uh, there is, I mean, I'm not sure I understood the question, but it's clear that people can actually make roots on the fly. Right? Think about it. I mean, if you can't remember a word or something, you know, you could just come up with some sort of combination of segments, you know, and somehow hope that this is a noun. Actually, this is a very interesting discussion because, for example, Hagit Borer, who believes that basically roots are identified only phonologically, believes that the language uh, in principle can have as many roots as legitimate combinations of its segments. I mean, in principle, of course, then morphology does the thing. Um, and uh, that there is nothing interesting, perhaps, uh, in the fact that you know Hebrew is assumed to have only three to five hundred roots, whereas English is assumed to have uh, roughly ten to twenty thousand roots, because that that's that's a fact that. Is, is discussed every now and then, you know, as, as a sort of curiosity. Um, uh, the other, I mean, extending a bit the, this the, this question, uh, trying to, you know, be, be more critical of the way I see things, perhaps you could say something along the lines of, um, you know, uh, look, there is no such thing as uh, fixed roots, but you know the the whole root thing is in a constant flux, and that my time super principle is complete rubbish, and that you can rearrange your root repertory um, as you grow older. Uh, that would be interesting. I would hope there is some way of testing the idea that you fix your roots once and for all, but that you can revisit them and then see which is the right version. And uh, a question by uh, Julio Barbosa. Uh, he asks, if we consider this feature-free, semantic-free approach to roots, how would this approach be different to Jack and Duff's construction grammar or Lanaker's cognitive grammar apart from a lexicon? 
Wow. The answer is, I don't know. I mean, I think that Jack and Dove's framework and Langacker's actual framework are pretty different in the kind of assumptions they come from, right? I mean, uh, my answer is, I don't know. I think they will be very different in the sense that this is not a kind of framework. I mean, the, the one I tried, the, the one I framed my, my, my talk into, it's not a kind of framework that relies on massive memorization and multiple rule systems or anything. So, and also Langacker, I, you know, doesn't really believe in the distinction between language and the rest of higher cognitions. So, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Massively is my answer. And uh, a final question by P. John. Uh, do roots have selectional features? Ah, yeah. Okay. That's a good question. Because <laughs> when someone, when some guy comes and tells you that he's going to talk about roots in 2020, this is something he should talk to you about. Also, whether roots can project, right? I mean, these are like the really hot topics. And these I like cunningly left out. Okay. Now, about roots projecting, I'm not going to talk. I mean, you should have asked me. I'm not going to do it myself. <laughs> but about root selectional features, well, here's the thing. Every time you believe that the root, not its form, because I mentioned that in the slide, has selectional features, it turns out that the, the selectee is actually the selector. One of my favorite examples I wish I had, maybe I can share my notepad here. Wait, I'll try working some working some magic here. God, you can tell I'm a Gen Z person. I think computers are magic anyway. Okay. Um, sorry, bear with me, please. Okay, so. Um, right, okay, so I'll have to share this now. So if I can share my screen, screen for a sec. I'll, I'll show what I mean. Where is the notepad? Here's the notepad. Okay, notepad, do that for me. Great. So if you look at these guys here, okay, uh, you have, uh, I'm not sure you can see them. I, perhaps I should make the letters bigger. Can I do this? We'll make them bigger, bigger. I don't know. Let's make them like this. Okay, what you have here is kur, kur, kur. Now, kur is a root in Greek, and it's radically empty. Now, um, these are exponents of a verbalizer. And actually, in traditional Greek grammar, what they tell you, in modern Greek grammar, what they tell you is that this is a root, but this is the verbal stem, right? So these guys, all they do is they make verbal stems. Ev, ar, and ar. I'm sorry, R, right? Now, the interesting thing is that uh, this is an exceptional root because it can combine with more than one of these uh, forms, right? Uh, but in the case of most Greek verbs, what happens is that it looks like particular roots select particular um, verb stem makers, right? So these are the roots, this is the verb stem maker. So for the vast majority of Greek verbs, it looks like, um, yeah, every root selects uh, which of these guys, or other guys actually, it's going to make a verb stem with. So the standard understanding is exactly what, what you said, right? That roots selects the kind of element that will make a verb stem with. Now, on the, on the other hand, there are verbs like the ones here, where it looks like that the root and the particular version, the particular form, um, are not in a selection relation, but in a happy coincidence relation. So uh, this stem here means give a haircut. This um, stem here means treat, as in health treatment. 
Oh God. And this, I'm sorry, this one means tire exhaust. So the point I'm trying to make here is that you might as well say that if, if these little things here are exponents of the verbalizer, these are exactly the things that do the selection. So the selection probably doesn't work from the root to, let's say, declension classes or whatever, but I, either it's the other way around or it's a happy coincidence sort of thing and that there are some lexical gaps. Now, what I'm saying here is just hand waving, obviously. I mean, this is not the kind of explanation I would be happy with, but it looks like that once you, once you divorce the root from its exponents, from its forms, then you can have a clearer picture about what selects what. When it comes to orthodox, old style, old fashioned C selection, I don't think that roots do that. Okay, fantastic, Tivus. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy. I know that you are tired. We have some more questions, but I'm not sure whether I should include them. And, well, I mean, uh, uh, have a good time. I don't know. I mean, it's up to yeah, the Yeah, maybe, maybe an additional one by Janayuna who said that she has an additional question. And okay. she asks, but uh, several phenomena are guided by the content of the roots, presumably. Take naturally reflexive verbs, uh, come, behave, etc. How does syntax know when to use a reflexive and it is not necessary? Yes, um, my question is, are these reflexes of the root itself or the verbalized root? Mm. Um, that, that's a question you can hardly ask about English because, you know, in English, roots tend to look like free morphemes and there's this whole discussion whether there is zero derivation in the end. You know, some people most of us say there is, and people have very serious arguments against it. So when you look at behave, which is inherently um, reflexive, is that this inherent reflexivity, is it a property of the root itself or of the subcategorial structure? Yeah. Right, because remember that if you understand everything, including, um, uh, you know, argument structure in terms of structural relations, right, and not as a list of properties, um, then uh, you can say that, you know, behave is an inherently reflexive verb uh, because this is a property of it as a verb, and not a property of the root. And um, that's also the kind of explanation you need when you think of the old Harley discussion, when I say old, I mean 2005, about mass and count roots. So the idea was there that, you know, bleed is atelic because blood is mass, right? And that uh, foal, you know, these can hail examples, right? Is tillic because uh, foals are count, right? And that's very interesting because the correlation is not about the root, but about the kind of noun you get, right? Which s correlates with the kind of verb you get in terms of, as, of its actionsart. And that's nothing to do with the root. It has to do with the noun and the verb, right? Because it looks like, and that's actually the, the Hale and Kayser story, that the verb uh, foal contains the actual noun, not just the root, okay? And uh, of course, you know, there were counter examples like stone. I mean, stone, the noun is both mass and count, but the verb stone, in the sense of throwing stones, right? Um, well, it's a, that, it's throwing stones. It actually contains the noun, not just the root. Because if you want to look at the verb that contains just the root stone, you get stone in the sense of get high. This is the old, you know, hammer tape thing. Okay. Thank you, Fifu, so much for such a fantastic Thank you, lecture. Thank you for the um, uh, yeah, I'm really glad that we have here have you again here remotely in Brazil again. Hopefully you yeah. come once more. And uh, I think everybody that is uh, watching us right now, I, I ask you. you to clip stay safe and healthy. And I hope to see you again uh, in another opportunity. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.